Hello everyone, welcome to this video conference entitled The Anatomy of the Gospel. And today we will analyze from an anthropological perspective a fascinating phenomenon, the eschatological prophetism of the classic age. This phenomenon has been found in Hebrew, Greek, and Roman prophetic texts written between the 8th century before Christ and the 2nd century after Christ. These texts share similarities in their eschatological content, addressing uh, the religious concept of the last days. However, only the Hebrew prophetic texts uh, deal profusely regarding eschatology, and today we will discover how the message of the Gospel is strongly tied uh, to this phenomenon from a non-theological approach, that will consider mostly the cultural background from ancient traditions and beliefs, of course documented by historians and archaeologists. The phenomenon of prophetism is defined as all the themes related to the behavior, beliefs, and messages of the prophets. They didn't belong specifically to an ethnical group or tradition. They were male and female prophets among Israelites, Mesopotamians, Greeks, and people from other nations. The most accepted definition of prophet has been formulated by Weypert in the New Bible Lexicon from 1997 that says a person who, through a cognitive experience, visions, auditory experiences, theophanies, dreams, or similar, becomes a subject to the divine revelations, and is also aware of being sent by the divinity or divinities in order to transmit the revelation in verbal form as a prophecy or prophetic speech, or through acts of non-verbal communication, symbolic acts to a third party who is the true recipient of the message. For the most part, prophets were not appearing and disappearing mysteriously all the time. They were qualified and allocated religious servants uh, devoted to their, specific, to their respective tribes and cities, often belonging to the priesthood class. Of course, uh, there were some exceptions of known prophets. Eastern prophets spoke their messages in, in short sentences. Examples found in ancient Mesopotamian texts are the Mari text. They are Neo-Assyrian prophecies from Nineveh that they are studied in the University of Helsinki in Finland. We cannot assure that all the ancient prophets were similar. Still, there are remarkable differences between the prophets, the prophets of ancient Israel and others to their uh, abundant literature and ad in addition to the use of uh, poetry and the approach of humanistic topics, which characterizes them especially. During the time of Babylonian exile, 6th century before Christ, uh, this prophetic text uh, began to appear frequently and ceased to be produced around the 3rd or 2nd century before Christ, when Israelites experienced uh, serious political and social issues under the Seleucid Greek dynasty. Another difference was that the Israelite prophets during this time did not need to perform technical rituals to get any divine communication. What is clear, there were situations that intensified the phenomenon of the prophetism, like tyranny, hasty political pacts and wars. A prophecy is therefore a, a symptom of, of, of civil and political commotions and where divine communication occur uh, either to lift the fallen spirits or to confront harsh consequences. However, with prophetism of the classical age or the classic age, we talk about some specific books. As you can see in your screen, uh, religious hero literature, the book of the prophet Isaiah, Jeremiah, 
Ezekiel, Daniel, the Gospel itself, a religious Greek literature, we have Hesiod Labors and Days, the Sibylline in Books, the Book of Revelations, uh, and the civil and oracles from the, the first century before Christ, and I mean the replaced books. All these books mentioned are a collection of divine messages according to their sources, and I did not include the book of the prophet Joel in the Hebrew literature because it's not been precise from what century it came from. The civil and oracles of Cumi were written before the Roman Republic, more or less uh, sex, uh, sixth century before Christ. The last king of Rome, Lucius Tarquinus Superbus, owned those books. He was contemporary of the Athenian politician Solon and the Persian emperor Cyrus the Great. Uh, the original civilian books were destroyed when the temple of, the, of Jupiter was burned in the year 83 before Christ, but, there were, but were replaced by copies brought in the year 76 before Christ, gathered from Troy, Eritrea, Samos, Sicily, and Africa. Uh, the Roman Senate ordered uh, take them to Cumi. Probably uh, those copies and others from Alexandria were the copies what inspired the fourth eclogue that the Roman poet Virgil wrote during the year 40 before Christ. And I'm going to read a little bit of this, a little portion of this fourth eclogue that is quite interesting. Now the last age by Cumi's civil song has come and gone, and the majestic role of circle centuries begins anew. Justice returns old Saturn's reign. And please pay attention to the next verse because it's very important and remind it for later. With a new breed of men sent down from the heaven, only do thou at the boy's birth in whom the iron shall cease, the golden rays arise. Befriend him, chast Lucina, this thine own Apollo's reign, and in thy consulate this glorious age, O Polio, shall begin. And the months enter on their mighty march, under thy guidance, what such tracks remain of our all wickedness once done away. Shall free the earth from never ceasing fear, he shall receive the life of gods and see heroes with gods commingling, and himself be seen of them, and with his father's worth reign over a world at peace. As I said, quite interesting. It is sure that Virgil is quoting to the oracles of the seal of Cumi in Naples, place where he wrote his eclogues. The priests there were consecrated to Apollo. Virgil studied and admired the ancient Greek theology, kept by the Greek poet Hesiod. By the way, his book called Works and Days from the 8th century before Christ describes, among other topics, the first mythical age, when the time of a golden lineage of men were created by the first immortal who inhabited the Mount Olympus. They lived during the era of Cronos when he reigned in heaven. Works and Days, verses 109 and following. There are two literary references more about the Golden Age, a commentary of Politicus in Politicus, that is a treatise uh, written in the year 370 by Plato, before Christ, of course, and Metamorphosis by Ovid. Uh, written in the year 8 after Christ. 
As we can see, the theology found in Western sources match with some elements of the Tanakh, known of as the Old Testament. Those ancient sources share some similarities with regard to the early days of the humankind. Uh, for example, their longevity, uh, the lifestyles, uh, they were clearly depicted by uh, this kind of narrative similar to the Garden of Eden and the Sumerian Dilmun Garden. In my personal opinion, I don't think the Israelites borrowed uh, neither the Greek theology nor the Sumerian theology in order to write the book of Genesis. The first book of the Bible is basically a counter-history and a theologized version that rivals against the older war views. And, for example, the Sumerian Dilmun was a perfect garden in which there's no disease, there's no death, and no one suffers. In this place, everything is pure and perfect, and life has not setbacks. However, this land is made by and for the gods, as attested in a temple hymn written in Sumerian cuneiform script on clay, dedicated to Larsa from the year 1950 before Christ. So, it uh, makes more sense to think that remains into the historical memory of the ancient cultures a com common elements that are acknowledged as, as an ancient knowledge of the world. Uh, therefore, uh, we have a question that arises. Is there any specific reason why a variety of uh, ancient cultures shared such similarities? The answer, the answer points out that dispensationalism was an important theme to the oldest, the oldest civilization. This dispensationalism probably came from an, an astronomical knowledge that evolved and be, became part of their customs and uh, idiosyncrasies. Dispensationalism depends of the, on the precise counting of the time. This is only possible due to the calendars. Those who were able to design calendars were able to control the time and also leading the, the civilized world. But every ancient culture developed their own calendars. So our first conclusion will be, fundamentally, all the ancient civilizations share the same patterns of an astrological religion. Such religion, at some point, favored a network of sacred places over different uh, geographic sites. The heavens in ancient times have been considered the divine domain, especially of the Uranic gods. And this concept is interesting, and I borrowed uh, from the Treaty on the History of Religion by the historian and philosopher Mircea Eliade. Well, I suppose that's the pronunciation. Who explained the phenomenon of Uranic gods as the cosmogonic creators who manifest themselves by hierophanies like lightning or the wind, go into the depths of the firmament at the end of their works, leaving instead to their children the task of completing the, the creation and intervening the human affairs. Uranic gods were forgotten and replaced by worshipping the children of those gods who were delegated to a specific and earthly functions. Prayer to the Uranic gods are only used as a last resort. In this category, Mirzia Iliadi places deities such as Uranus from the ancient Greece, Ahura Mazda from Persia, and Anu from the ancient Sumer, among others. Ancient cultures believed that the existence and life were provided by the heavens. The gods were the celestial bodies 
seen in the skies during those days. In some cultures, the primordial mighty beings from the heavens, of course, are not called gods, but giants or titans. Considered as terrible forces, they were subdued by their own children and trapped into the abyss. Then, the children of the gods were the only beings able to control those ungovernable primordial forces. Them, the children of the gods, gave birth to the founders' kings of the ancient civilized world. Those kings build empires to demonstrate they were demigods and bearers of the divinity. Greeks knew the story of Uranus, the almighty power that was defeated by his child Cronus. In the Nordic mythology we find a similar pattern. Emir the giant was the first creator and he was murdered by his own kin, his grandchildren. So cute. <laughs> Another example is found in Babylonian myths. Tiamat was killed by her child Marduk. These archetypes point out an astrological dispensationalism and its patterns will be studied in detail for another session. The important thing is to under the important thing is to understand that the primordial forces of the universe were controlled by a council of gods. Those gods were worshipped by the first kings, later emperors of the ancient civilized world. The primordial powers of the heavens were subdued and hidden in order to create the mankind and the civilized world. Keep it in mind. If the primordial forces come back to rule the universe, it would be the end of the mankind, at least from the point of view of those who compose the ancient cosmogonic myths. And by the way, uh, those myths were useful to provoke a deep psychological rejection and negation of the real power of the existence. In one hand, the gods of the kings and emperors were patrons of the humankind. In the other hand, the primordial forces were so powerful and terrible that never should be invoked or evoked because everything will be destroyed. Here we have an example of how the fear of destruction preserved ancient cults that empowered to the kings and emperors. Their gods gave them the laws that kept and nourished the humankind and to this reason uh, the ancient kings and emperors considered themselves as demigods. They came from the lineage of the gods and they must be obeyed as lesser gods. The astrological religion and its knowledge was a perfect excuse to build the civilized world as we know it. The Bible offers an interesting approach about this worldview. We are going to read Genesis chapter 6 verses 4 and 5. There were the Nephilim on the earth on, in those days, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the weakness, that the wickedness of men was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. 
As we have noticed, this reading is understood clearly under the scope of our session without mentioning concepts such as angels, for example. When the Bible talks about angels, uses the Hebrew voice malachim in plural, which means accurately messengers of the king or heralds, a sort of representatives of or spokesmen or spoke sorry spokespersons of the king himself. The Hebrew voices malach and melech share notable uh, linguistic similarities. Now, do you remember when I mentioned not forget the quotation of Virgil in the fourth eclogue that says, with a new breed of men sent down from heaven? Well, just keep it in mind to understand that we must consider the previous worldviews of the past in order to elaborate accurately any interpretation of the Bible or other ancient text. The renowned men mentioned in Genesis chapter 6 were the same mighty men that built fortified cities and kingdoms over the earth, but at the same time they brought a great wickedness. That means they influenced changes into our natural world with malevolence. In Hebrew, uh, the word that translates wickedness is the voice ra'at, that literally means bad sign, bad omen, malice, or, and, or evil. Those great warriors and hunters expanded the, their kingdoms beyond their borders. Later, in order to improve their crowd manipulation, uh, they built temples into their cities to control the donations and tributes to the gods besides <laughs> to protect their people from hostile outsiders, of course, char charging for this protection. All this feudal system existed before the Middle Age due to the, the management of the sciences. The monarchy took the sciences as a religious tool of mind controlling. Eventually, the royal lineage became into local gods. When they died, of course, as the case with Romulo, founder of Rome, or Nimrod that built and named his city by his own name. We have these examples, but there are more. Sciences, military victories, governance, and protection were gifts from the gods in order to establish a parallel government on the earth. This way, the renowned hunters, warriors, city founders gained celebrity as demigods. It was believed that they were the reflection of the divine powers in the heavenly realms. But again, the Bible offers view against the paradigm of the astrological religion and their kings due to their frequent abuses in matter of so social justice and violation of human rights. And we are going to read the first book of Samuel. And Samuel spoke all the words of God to the people that asked for a king, and he said, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for him on his chariot and among his horsemen, and they shall run before his chariots, and he may appoint for himself captains over thousands and captains over fifties and that they may plough his ground and reap his harvest and make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots 
and he will take your your dollars for perfumers and cooks and bakers and your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards the best will he take and give to his servants and you shall be his servants and you shall cry out in that in that day because of your king whom you have chosen and God will not answer you in that day well I had to dramatize this because it was really serious God stands in testimony in close to the gods El judges El was the name of the highest Semitic deity among Ugarites Arameans, Phoenicians, and Canaanites. How long will you judge unrighteously, facing the wicked as accepted? Defend the poor and the fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and the destitute, rescue the poor and needy, release them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, we are talking about the gods, they know not, neither do they understand, they walk in darkness, without a course, all the fundaments of the earth. I have said, you are gods, and you are the children of the Most High, but you shall die like man, and fall like the princes and we are talking about rulers from the aforementioned translation we understand the old paradigm it wasn't going well and the divine knowledge and justice as fundaments of the earth were missing from the ancient kings and their kingdoms they should be the first one the first ones accomplishing all the religious duties and ethics. The failure of the kings were the image of the religious system failure. So, the Psalm 82 is a clear demonstration of a deep social crisis and lack of human rights. The end of the age of the gods was considered a dangerous and feared, and feared event prophesized not against the basil, against the basils, and I mean people like you and me, but certainly against the old religions and their kings. As we have read under the Virgil's perspective in his fourth eclogue, that announced the return of a golden era, a new beginning and a new end of the previous world order. If the ruling gods nourish the world, what will happen if, they, if their cults disappear? The gods will turn against the humans and against each other to survive. Their reigns were destined to end someday. Indeed, what was really prophesied is the arrival of a new order or a new man or a new emperor that will rules as a representative of the most higher power, until reaching the whole restoration of the justice and human rights without, without any additional cult. From the Israelite perspective, this event would not have a good ending for its inherited cult, because we need to remember that many cults from the past came from from other gods. I mean, many religious practices were similar. The prophetic visions of the end of days in the book of Daniel were frightening and feared, and the name of the South book Daniel suggests a judgment of the Almighty subduing all the lesser powers and the cruelty of the conquerors. This worldwide event would change all drastically, 
But the most important issue was the necessity of a deep process of restoration in the praxis of human ethics. The role of the traditional religion was to convey uh, the primordial ethics through all generations, not forgetting the principles of justice and human rights. From the perspective of the Bible, the religious life, it wasn't enough and failed to fulfill its purpose. If we read carefully the book of Daniel, we will understand that the end of the inherited ancient cults included not only the others, also the Jewish ancient practices. In the other side, into the pagan, pagan world, the Roman Republic expected to be uh, the embodiment and the fulfillment of a new era prophesied by the ancient religious included the Jewish prophecies. So basically uh, Christ will not rescue the glory of Israel during a long time because a, a destruction of the old system was required in order to repair the human values and bring better justice. And quoting to Christ, by the way, unless your righteousness surpass of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter to the kingdom of the heaven. Matthew chapter 5 verse 20. So the whole concept of religion should be transformed into something better. The arrival of the end of the times under the establishment of a new world order, I know, sounds odd, <laughs> had been announced hundreds of years before Christ, abroad the ancient world by the civilian oracles and by an ancient Assyrian prophecy that said, and please pay attention to this, our earth is degenerated in these later days there are signs that the world is speedily coming to an end bribery and corruption are common children no longer obey their parents every man wants to write a book and the end of the world is evidently approaching a Syrian clay tablet from the year 2800 before Christ Wow. In order to be prepared for that event, the restoration of the values of justice and kindness were a mandatory purpose.